everyone. Hopefully you've had lots of coffee, because this is a, well, you're probably going to need it for this session. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me, first of all, uh, to my first WordCamp ever, um, and to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is projects. Um, and some of the, the talks I've already seen this afternoon have been great, um, including Sabrina's, who, uh, her shout out to the Lean Startup was fantastic. Um, but first and foremost, who am I? My name is Vicky Jakes. Um, I am a project professional. I've been working on digital projects for over 10 years, um, working in an agency setting, working with lots of different types of clients, corporate, um, small business, um, and I'll talk you through kind of some of my experiences working with those guys. Um, I've never trained um, on, uh, like, uh, formally to be a project manager. I'm not Prince 2 certified or anything like that, but I have recently become a scrum master which is terribly exciting. Um, and I decided to stop working uh, recently in, uh, as a project professional uh, and start working for myself freelance, helping small businesses kind of get sites online um, and get their digital marketing strategies sorted. So that's a little bit about me. So over to you guys. How many people here have worked on a project that went a little bit iffy at the end? Come on. Come on. You might not have been the developer or the project manager. You might have been the client or designer. Come on, let's have a proper look. Everyone here. Who hasn't worked on a project that went wrong? Lies, lies, lies. Um, they're what I like to call dumpster fire projects, essentially. You know, like um, the type of project that just as you're about to hand it over uh, to a client sort of spontaneously combusts. And it's always in the last week, you know, the last week where you're meant to go live on the Monday, and there's features that no one thought about that need to be added, and some of the code breaks because you didn't have enough time to do testing. And the client decides to go away on holiday that week, so the project manager's doing design decisions, and just everything goes wrong. You know the type of project I mean. Well, it's good to know that we're not alone, friends, and that some of you have worked on projects like this. Maybe in the, the Q&A session afterwards, you can tell me about some of those projects. And um, Tom Cargill from Bell Labs famously expressed that the first 90% of the code accounts for the first 90% of the development time, and the remaining 10% of the code accounts for the other 90% of the development time. It's a joke, um, but essentially what it's meant to say is that most of the work is done in that final 10%. Um, and we wonder why, because the, pro uh, the um, Project Management Institute, uh, with this lovely graph, have kind of explained how projects really are meant to run. They're meant to be this lovely, genteel start that kind of build up as you move into the development flow. The development all happens and then slowly tails off and then you hand the project over, and it's all very calm. But actually, I think that the reality of getting a project built these days is um, this meme from Toothpaste for Dinner, which kind of explains, uh, in my experience, how a lot of projects go, all oh, the work's done in the kind of final 10%, uh, and sometimes there's crying as well. So <laughs> why, why have we all put our hands up saying, we're still working on difficult projects? Why is that the case? Uh, have we become the Snapchat generation? I'm not that old, by the way, but have we become the Snapchat generation that can't focus long term? Uh, can we only cope with briefings that are as long as an Instagram story? Um, well, I'm a bit concerned because I think that the way that um, trends are going is that we're being encouraged, especially from CEOs of big companies, like Elon Musk here, famously telling Tesla employees, if you're bored, or you're not finding a meeting useful, you can walk out. I'm really worried, you guys, about the commitment that we have to delivering projects these days. So I just referred to my notes here. Uh, an IDC looking at improving IT project outcomes report back in 2009 looked at IT projects. And over um, that survey saw that uh, a quarter of them failed. And that definition was whether it kind of went over budget or over time. And nearly a quarter of those had no return on investment. And over half of those projects had to be reworked in some capacity. So code had to be refactored, rebuilt, bin, started again. Um, and I get that, right? Because back in 2009, when I was delivering projects, it was kind of pre the Silicon Valley, uh, that sort of Silicon Valley app boom. You know, people weren't using agile as liberal as a phrase as they were uh, back, back then. And um, I get it. I get that projects would fail at that time. We were still kind of getting it right. 
But uh, looking at a, our friends at Project Management Institute again, uh, the Pulse of the Profession report that was released uh, at the start of this year that kind of looked at project successes, over a third, nearly a third, failed their goals. Uh, and nearly half, 43% went over budget, and nearly half, 48%, overran. That's nine years later. Why is this still happening, you guys? Why are projects still failing in some capacity? And there should be an assumption here. Uh, oh, that's a shame. I've basically highlighted, and it's not shown up on the screen, that uh, the, the kind of second two points, the 43% over budget and the 48% overrunning. Now, when a project overruns, um, it's likely that um, more build needs happen, more testing needs happen. And subsequently, it's costing the project more money as well. And you can assume that that is all happening in the final 10% of the project. So uh, I've just picked a stock image here of people that work in an agency. You know, why, why are we working on projects that still fail? These guys, they look smart, they look happy, they work in an agency setting. I work with some really smart people over the years, developers, designers, UX specialists, clients as well, um, and still we're working on failed projects. So what I'm going to do here quickly is just take you through some of the projects that I've worked on that have failed. Mm. And I'm going to kind of see it as group therapy, really. So bear with me, because I haven't always worked on bad projects. But I'm going to share with you some of my own doozies. So first and foremost is the pharma project, uh, as in pharmaceuticals. So this project was um, meant to be an innovation project for this particular pharma company. Um, adopting Drupal as a framework, as opposed to .NET, which pharma had traditionally gone through in the past, because you know, it meant security. Um, but the idea behind using Drupal was very much like with WordPress, it's a pre-existing framework, it's got a community, it's open source, so it doesn't cost anything. And they were very attracted to that idea. And because the agency I work for specialised in Drupal, uh, we could give a rough indication of how long that project should take and how much it should cost. Um, the project was going to be connected to an external API, SAP in particular, um, and then there were security needs as well, so that API needed to run through the client's firewall. And also, if anyone here has ever worked with a pharmaceutical client, you know that there needs to be a legal compliance to any content um, that goes out uh, so that the pharma company can avoid millions of pounds worth of fines. Um, this project failed. <coughs> failed. Why did it fail? Well, um, the scope and the strategy weren't really set at the beginning. I think we as an agency were so excited to win the business, and um, it was a real game changer for us, that we didn't really make that estimate um, into kind of a, a concrete scope. And also, because the deadline was fixed for when we had to deliver this, another reason why we won the business, we started kind of building and thinking that we would solve some of these problems um, that didn't get addressed in the scoping phase later on. And from the client side, the strategy wasn't really set. And that was because there were so many stakeholders. It's really common in the pharma world to deal with a brand manager who kind of works with a global brand manager. And then you've got the legal team. And the guy in the legal team doesn't understand what this internet thing is. So there'll be another person connected with that. There are IT guys. So lots and lots of stakeholders, uh, which meant getting decisions made was very difficult. Um, because when a decision is made by committee, it takes a while. And remember, we were in a fixed time frame to deliver this project. And so because we were in a fixed time frame, and the cost was also fixed, um, any problems that we encountered, like the big problem being the one that we encountered with uh, working with the API, uh, because there wasn't enough documentation, so we had to do a a lot of reverse engineering. Uh, the process kind of got abandoned um, because some of the senior people at the agency thought that um, letting the client call whenever they wanted, email whenever they wanted, was showing value. And actually, sticking to the process would have meant uh, we were dealing less with their emails and actually solving some of the problems. So the project wasn't all bad. It got delivered in the end, but over budget, and probably about four months late. But it just made people unhappy. Uh, and that's not what we want when we kind of come to our workplaces each day. We don't want to be unhappy. Um, so the next project is the finance project, um, specifically a, a health insurance company that we work with. Uh, and this was a new concept, a new product that had been tested rigorously with the market. And when they came to us, it was very much um, them being a kind of a, a startup sponsored by the city. 
um, and wanted us to uh, quickly br like, uh, build an MVP and bring that to market so that they could kind of test the concept and then get it rolled out to um, uh, a kind of a bigger client base. Again, Drupal, uh, and with a little bit of WordPress on the side as well. This is kind of before um, you know, uh, it was either one or the other. And with some custom code um, and lots of stakeholders once again. So obviously, this isn't uh, about the projects that went well. This is the projects that failed, and this one failed. It, it overran probably by about six months, um, not because of us or anything that we did. Um, mainly because I think this project had too many stakeholders, lots of people with lots of opinions. And so that meant that uh, the project started um, really before the scope was finalized, because those stakeholders were kind of adding in new, um, uh, new feature requests uh, and new requests from the market as the project went on. Um, and again, it was a fixed price project with a fixed deadline. And so as we got to the end of that process, there wasn't enough testing because we were so keen to get it delivered on time. And of course, without enough testing, it went out to market, uh, the, the test market, um, and then came back, had to, uh, code had to be rebuilt, uh, new features had to be added. It, it was just a, a hot mess, basically. The final um, project I'm going to share with you is uh, the Agile project. And I'll just do this Agile like this. <laughs> um, this was a React web-based mobile-first platform. Um, and quite exciting, because we were going to work with another agency, uh, an innovation project again. And what was exciting about this is there, there was a beta group of testers um, who were going to be able to provide us with feedback. We were able to then make changes to the features, optimize it for those guys, and then kind of keep releasing until they were happy, and then go out to the wider market, as, as Agile should work. This project failed, again, I think because the process failed. Um, Agile was given a lot of lip service. It was very fashionable at some point, um, as I'm sure you guys can empathize to say a project was Agile, because the client loved that. They thought it was very sexy, very Silicon Valley. Um, and we didn't really get any communication from that beta group, not properly. Um, and in the end, we were actually just given a, a fixed deadline to deliver the project. And so with all three of these projects, kind of what happened was most of the work was done in the final 10%. Um, immensely stressful. People weren't very happy. And I think, you know, the first, um, the first port of call in, um, in a project that's kind of failed is to blame the project manager or the lead developer or, you know, just blame, 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 or blame the client. Um, that's quite an easy one for us all in this room, is it, to blame the client. Um, and I get that. I get it's easy to kind of um, lay the blame. Um, but um, it, it all depends if that scope was set at the beginning or not. You see, setting scope um, and then setting um, the, um, the parameters of how that scope can change in the beginning of the project is what means um, it won't fail, as in overrun, over budget in that final 10%. Um, allowing a scope to have input from the experts at the beginning is vital to make sure a project doesn't fail. Um, you know, if a salesperson is selling something to a client and they're putting an estimation together, and they've never actually signed that off um, with the tech team in-house, or you might just be a one-man band uh, working with, you know, a client working with one developer. You know, um, uh, and if that kind of concept hasn't been fleshed out by the developer, it's only been fleshed out by the client, you know, there's potential for the project to fail. An agreement of what to do if the scope creeps also is fundamental for any project in order for it not to fail. Uh, and that willing to be flexible can kind of be seen here in the old iron triangle, which we've seen. You can have, it, uh, you have all the features on time, um, but it's going to cost you. Um, or you can have it on time and cheap, but you can't have all the features. And the willingness to be flexible with one of those points um, you know, means that a project um, won't fail on that final 10% because uh, that final deadline can be moved. Or there'll be cash to allow for kind of features to be built. Leadership. Super important for any project not to fail. I think that's a given, isn't it? Um, our PMI report. Uh, that I spoke about earlier, 
details that executive sponsor engagement is the top driver of effective strategy delivery. Well, what's all that corporate speak mean? Well, essentially, it means um, you need a gaffer on any project um, to see it through from beginning to end. And that can't be the client. And usually, in-house, right, it's either a, a project manager um, or a project director. Um, but there should be some level of kind of director level sponsorship happening for any project in house at an agency, I think, because quite often project managers might think, I'm just here to oversee the day to day process. Having a leader, it could be even the MD of an agency, but having a leader overseeing the project from beginning to end is vital. Because, back to our PMI report, they state that stakeholder, as stakeholder influence decreases, projects cost more. So it's really vital to kind of keep a, a sharp pair of eyes on a project from the beginning to the end. And that's really hard when project fatigue sets in, especially if a project's been going on for months. Uh, in the pharmaceutical world, we could be working on a project for up to a year, and there would be a lot of project fatigue happening there, especially if stuff's having to be rebuilt or you're putting it out to market and people aren't happy, so you need to come back and kind of test the concept again. And great leadership is what enabled Gareth Southgate to take essentially what was a quite young, inexperienced England team all the way to the semi-finals. But his project kind of failed in the last 10% as well, so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Gareth. Um, the third point I want to talk about is process. So we talk about process a lot in the project world. We love process. Um, and process is vital for ensuring that a project doesn't fail at the end. Projects that fail at the end, as the, um, the examples that I've given you guys just now, um, have often failed because process got abandoned in some capacity. Um, because we were worried that the client might, might ask for their money back. Um, we were worried about losing our reputations. Um, or we were worried that we weren't doing a good enough job. So sticking with process is um, super important. Um, and agreeing that process for how a project should be delivered is done in that scoping phase. And sticking to it, well, that's done by your, your leader and your leadership team. And all of these things kind of link quite importantly together. And why I've got your attention, let's talk about Agile as a process, because it's given a lot of lip service, but um, if a project is fixed price, it's not agile. It's never going to be agile. If it's got a fixed deadline, <laughs> it's not going to be agile. Um, oh, this, this hasn't got the impact, but there's, it should kind of, kind of come across as red. But if your project <laughs> won't allow you to iterate, test, and bring it back in and iterate it and test it, it's not agile. It's not agile. Agile is all about... Um, allowing your project to be tested by the users, by the, like Sabrina was talking about earlier, by the very end users that are going to be using the product, taking that feedback, bringing it back in, implementing it, and bringing it back out and testing, and then releasing it. If a project is run um, using the Agile methodology, Scrum framework, uh, the Agile framework using Scrum methodology, then you would never fail in the final 10%, as it were, because you would always be improving that product. So it's really worth thinking about how we can stop failing at our projects by maybe looking to Agile and seeing, taking the best, ways of, um, best uh, ways of working for that for our own projects. So one final uh, nod to our report earlier, which is um, the PMI's Pulse of Professional Report says that 83% of project managers report digital transformation has either moderately or dramatically impacted their work over the far past five years, which means that um, they found that implementing new ways of working, a change in their strategy of how they work, uh, has impacted them greatly. Now, if everyone here who put their hand up, I mean, that's most of this room, right, um, has, um, has noted that... Um, uh, that they've worked on projects in some capacity. And I can say that change works. It works. And implementing that within your way of working, whether you're a one-man band or whether you're in an agency setting or a freelancer, implementing some type of digital change will work. 
and it will stop these dumpster fire projects. Because you might be thinking, well, I'm delivering fine, Vicky. Uh, you know, great, good for you. You've, you've delivered some bad projects in your time, but mine are all fine, guys over there, right? But um, uh, implementing just one or two ways uh, uh, of working, or uh, improving, um, would be, um, uh, it would be detrimental to your business if you didn't try that. And I hear again and again and again um, from people uh, within the agency setting, client side as well. Ah, oh, if only we'd agreed this up front, or um, oh, if only we'd done this on the project, or oh, if only we'd stuck to the process, Vicky. And I'll give you this kind of one last takeaway for how to improve your project process and stop all of the, the work, the 90% of the work happening in the final 10%. And that's all about accountability. So we've talked a lot about teams um, and kind of the, the royal we, the royal R, as it were, in terms of our delivering our projects. But ultimately, delivering um, a project is all about the team members taking individual accountability. Now, you might be thinking, well, I already do that. I'm, I'm the developer. I do my development. I'm the UX specialist. I do my UXing. I'm the designer. I do that really well. Um, but it's kind of more than that. It's all about ensuring that your team members are doing what they should do as well. It's all, it's all about ensuring that you're raising questions if there's a problem, if the client puts in another feature and no one's pushed back on it. Checking each other's work. Um, looking at the bigger picture for how the project should be delivered. Because um, ultimately, we all want to do this right at the end of a project. We all want to look at memes on social media rather than get the rest of the project done. And really, we should be thinking individually, as well as with the team, about our own focus. Because if everyone's doing that, then the project will move towards um, getting completed. And making sure you've got the right tools as well. And if you haven't, um, raising your hand and saying so. And if you're worried about the project in any way, shape, or form, is raising your hands and asking questions. Why? Why are we doing it like this? Is this the right way? Is this right, more importantly, for the end user? And making sure, oop, and making sure that you've got uh, all of the information to be able to start your individual role is paramount. So not starting the project before all of that scope is agreed will stop the project failing in that last 10%. And then ensuring you've got inspiration, looking to your gaffer, looking to each other as well. Um, because then if you're asking questions, your leader will listen to you if they're a good enough leader as well. So just to kind of reiterate my kind of quick fix, guys, for how you should uh, ensure that your projects don't fail in the final 10% is to make sure that you think about scope. Now, you might already be doing this, but have a renewed thought about this when you go back to your offices on Monday. And they're looking around for leadership. If there's no leader, can that be you? And asking enough of your project management professionals, asking enough of your clients as well. And then ensuring that there's a process. And if the process fails in any way, being the one to put your hand up and say, what's going on? And that's everyone on the project team should be doing that, not just the project manager. And that ultimately should lead to you having a dumpster project at the end of a rainbow instead of a dumpster fire project. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky. Kind of reminds me of being at school, that 10, 90% sort of thing. Always the last night. Yep. Yeah. Horrible memories. Any questions? No? Does anyone want to share a bad project story with us? It's like group therapy. Yeah, that guy over there. Oh. I've got a question. Uh, do you ever have problems defining the process of the process? Yeah, but in the, um, in the Agile world, we're meant to not document too much and get going. But I think <laughs> uh, if, you, if you stick to the framework of what you've all agreed as a team, um, especially with Scrum, I think you, you don't have to worry too much about the process and educate the client on that process as well. I'm, I'm talking about the three things you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, so defining what scope is, 
defining what leadership is, defining what the process is. Yeah, and I, th in, and I can talk about this from an agile point of view when, when we're working in Scrum, is that those things should be defined at the beginning of the project anyway. Definitions should always be defined. So I think that's a really important point, is defining what that means, for sure. That's great, thank I, uh, you. Just get a mic. Too. You're talking about Agile and you're saying it's iterative. Um, how do you define these, you know, the scope and the deliverables when, it, when you don't know how long you're going to iterate? Um, well, do, I can, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So what I'm talking about here is often when the project's fixed price and fixed deadline, um, it'll often fail in the final 10% because of those reasons. So moving to that... Is, Absolutely. So moving a project to kind of an agile style of um, delivery would mean that, yeah, would mean that you'd avoid having that panic in the last 10%. Yeah. So it's not necessarily an advert for agile that I'm doing on stage here, but I'm just saying it's much more beneficial to work properly with agile than paying it lip service. Okay. One here. You yeah. No, go on. I'll let you. Oh. Steady. Oh, I turned my back. I hope that's yeah, on camera. Right. Done it. Stuntman. Um, so you're talking about using Agile as a way of avoiding the failure of sort of waterfall projects. Um, how do we define failure? Because if Agile's solution is to basically not have an end. Yes. <laughs> then again, again it, is it sort of dodging the? Yeah, true. The, and I think um, I, I get that. Like this is very top line and meant to be fun. But I think defining failure at the start of a project is really important as well. Quite often in the agency setting, which is what I'm talking about here, failure is when something's gone over budget or over time, uh, and a client will often define, help define that as well. Um, but at the beginning of a project, if we're all open to an iterative approach to delivering a project, then there would be no failure, potentially. Thanks. Any more? Nope. No? Last chance. Okay. Thank you. So we're done. Thank you very much, Vicky. Round of applause, please.